I've had a chance to think about this l once before. What, what, and you do it, I guess you could do it with a case history or with material, but at its best, between you and uh, a patient who kind of clicks with you. And that, and we know that doesn't always work, and, but when it works well, the unique thing about psychoanalysis is that it really gives you an opportunity to get in the inside world of somebody. Let's say that a woman came and she said, um, I want to get, um, I need to have a full-time relationship, which is a pretty typical, I think a slightly sophisticated person would say, I'm having a little trouble getting close to people, uh, therefore I break it off or whatever, I'm afraid of intimacy. So where would you learn that? Could you, I mean, you, that, that's, that starts with fear of intimacy. But actually, um, in the analysis, what really began to unfold is not simply that I was afraid of a relationship, but I'm afraid of the wrong relationship. There's a certain wisdom to the person in their psyche that I've got to break this off because it won't be right for me. But uh, all of those things are still in the unconscious, They're, and they won't really surface until you've got the kind of depth, you've got the kind of immersion, and you've got a chance to do what psychoanalysis does, which run relationships through the transference. There's a pattern here. Okay, and then it goes deeper, because um, you realize that the, that pattern for this particular person, maybe a lot of people, while on the surface it's the way that they've um, traditionally um, comfortably connected, has really always been a compromise for them for something else that's needed. And so then you gradually begin to help them and see yourself that there's, they've been abrogating or, um, and walling off a certain deeper need that they've had that this compromise has been on the holy bond. Well, that takes time. Uh, and so you need the, the depth of an analysis uh, and you need the frequency almost. You know, it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be four or five times a week, but it, you need enough frequency for this to start to emerge in a kind of consistent way. For the pattern that you're talking what about. With the pattern, yeah. That, and you know, you know, we talk about a patient who's also talented enough to, te to tell you how the, uh, their insights work, whether self-consciously or through derivatives that, where these patterns are just recur and the story is, has enough consistency that you begin to build up a, an image of what the internal world is like, how they correct it for the uh, problems, uh, what's wrong with the, the compromise, and uh, like that. So the patient that comes to you and says, my friends are saying I, I meet these guys, you have an idea, she keeps just meeting the wrong guys. So how does that play out with you if she uh, begins these relationships and, that are in a compromised way? How does that look when she gets in her treatment with you? Well, the, the good thing, and the, this, this is not the one person necessarily, the composite. Right, right. Uh, the good thing will be that on one hand, uh, a person who's used to a pattern of relating which is usually a, a, a solution that the psyche makes because something else has originally gone wrong. This solution will be repeated with you. Well, she will find in you her early experience with her parents, the same compromised relationship. Yes. Yeah. She'll find that in you. Find that. But given that you're not that person, how does she find that in you? Well, the, the attempt to reestablish it that way. Right. You know. And that's what you analyze. And sometimes people are really good at establishing it, and you get become immersed in it. Someone can be very well attuned to what makes an analyst, hey, that's interesting, blah, 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 tell more. Uh, Dr. Newman, I know you like me to tell this kind of story. No, really, I don't. Yes, you do, because, you know, patients go to, to a school on your... Uh, as they say in poker, Ben, 
They go to school on your tell, right? Are you a poker player? No, no okay. but he knows what he knows what tells are, right? Okay. So you go to school on your tell because you move your chair, your your voice goes up, and often the talented patients have gone to school on their parents for years to know what their tell is and how to dovetail with it. So you might get immersed in it and it might take you a while to realize, wait a minute. <coughs> and that's not always the worst thing. No, I've heard you actually describe that. The way in is the, the way out. The way out, yeah. So you get you in, but hopefully something will twig you to the fact that, wait a minute, I think. <laughs> What's that something that twigs you? What, like how maybe a dream. Mm -hmm. huh? Okay. Uh, that tells you you're replaying a particular role. Okay. Um, and hopefully you're alert to it. So you're also looking for in which way you've become involved or immersed in the yeah. same patterns that say, right. this young woman right. has played out with a number of people. Right. Um, and what does that and it's mean? probably inevitable that to some extent you do. How could it be otherwise? Yeah, how could it be otherwise? Yeah. And so once you understand that, how does that benefit the patient? Well, if, we're all, if it's going well, we'll say, wait a minute, I think, blah, blah, blah. Um, Often, uh, the patient, I think, will often, something will squeak in the patient. Mm -hmm. um, by squeak, I mean they're going to protest. So, well, it looks like, if, in the same way somebody may have broken off a relationship, and let's say it's a, a gal with a, a guy, and this, this particular composite of people, Often the guy doesn't know what hit them. I don't know, I thought we were doing very well, and she doesn't answer my calls, or vice versa. Well, we're going to be there, hopefully, when the, the um, urge in the patient came to break off the relationship. Because even though they've been involved in this compromise, one part of them has been recognizing this isn't good for me. So that may come up in the treatment, which is, you know what? Something's upsetting me, or some version of upsetting me, or I didn't feel like coming today, or uh, so we're supposed well, wait a minute, what do, what do you mean? I thought, uh, and uh, hopefully if you're going to be, say maybe there's something, there's a break. The break is because I've been too complicit with this pattern. And there's something coming up to the the patient is uh, signaling to me either by not wanting to come or something in a dream or some association that you become uh, the same player. You become the same player, and hopefully you're going to be able to say, "Ah, I think I, I see what's happened, uh, and I'm part of that." Yeah. Okay, we're. Now, sometimes you're going to be anticipating, you're going to be interpreting that before you enact it. But sometimes you don't understand it until you become part of it. How are you thinking about the patient when you might have an idea that the disruptions, there might be anger? Yeah, but it's, it's going to take time because the, um, it's, it's not the, uh, that's not so easy to say you're going to be mad okay. or I'm going to. <laughs> because the patient needs to be empathized with that they're having a loss. And I think we've learned from way back when, if you bring up anger too early, um, you're missing what, like, they, that, that it's a missing experience. That In some ways, you have to have first. the connection first. You have to have a connection. You have to have a loss of the connection. You have to have a loss of the connection and... Um, they're going to feel blamed. It's my anger that's getting. Yeah, you have to be have a good enough alliance, and really, to say you can. Of course, the anger is going to be there. What else? What else would come if you're going to? But that takes time. Originally, when I thought of this, I thought that um, you know we were we had a plurality of uh, we do of models. So we had the classical, relational, uh, then. Variation of self psychology. 
Winnicottian models, and I thought that there are some things that are common to all of them. It, in that everybody develops this external accommodative, whether it, uh, accommodative model, false self, whatever, to that extent, that way of relating to people um, is both a way of being connected on one hand, but it's also a way of protecting themselves from the access to deeper parts of themselves. And to some extent, that's a tragedy because it means that it takes a long time before someone will move from relating to someone uh, to what the healthier version of Winnicott talked about, using somebody. Because using somebody is not a, a, the old thinking about exploiting. It's being able to feel nurtured by the other person, being able to be in an intimate relationship, and to use that good feedback. But if your whole character structure is based on a, a kind of compromise, then part of the compromise involves having a veil between you and the other person, some kind of protective mechanism, then the deeper sense of yourself connected to another is really always blocked off. So usability is often a late factor in, in uh, treatment because you've got to work through, there's got to be an understanding of why one developed this um, protection uh, both in its adaptive and maladaptive ways. And then you have to understand what the motive for the protection was. And the motives for the protection are one, people either being frightened of their impulses or uh, conflicts with sex, or deep, more deeply, their fear of reactivating, remobilizing needs because their history has been often that those needs are going to be thwarted. And then I kind of added to that, um, which I think is implicit in nearly all the literature, but often not explicit enough, that one is frightened not only of the uh, needs themselves being just uh, thwarted, but the disappointment, the affects that we have that accompany those thwarted needs have never been fully integrated. So part of the protection of not using the other person, only relating to them, has been uh, motivated by the fear of two things, the needs themselves and the affects that accompany disappointment. So our work is really to gradually pay attention to those fears and probably in treatment if it's going to really work good, um, the we're going to have, part of our treatment method or philosophy is that there's going to be connections, hopefully, and then there's going to be breaks. Right. And that's where we really get called upon to be as good as our word. We're going to be able to help the patient see that we're part of the break, mm -hmm. whether it's a weekend or a misunderstanding or a mm -hmm. vacation. We're going to activate both the thwarted needs and the reactive rage. And we're now going to be part of that. And how are we going to do with it? Um, so Winnicott had a concept, survival of destruction, but what does that mean? It really means, are we going to be good sports when our patients say, you are failing me, I'm mad at you. You're, you're, because that, that, then we're started, then we're going to be the ones who have to, or you didn't understand me. Mm -hmm. And if we say you're wrong or we don't validate it, um, the patient may go along with you, but they're quietly going to say, my analyst can't take criticism, i.e. Just like mom. Is not, yeah, just like mom. I.e., though, in uh, uh, the concept not able to survive destruction. <laughs> Let me ask you now, what, after practicing 40-something years, what do you know now that you didn't know then? Um, 
And I don't think this is the only thing I know. When I was thinking a little bit about this, is that however um, however well coiffed and successful and um, contained most of our patients are, the thing that I've seen most uh, poignantly is that internally uh, most of them have missed one experience. Maybe a, a lot of people, not to, you don't have to be a patient. Uh, and that's the aspect of, have they ever really sensed that they've been, uh, they've had an advocate for their life in, in, embedded in them? And I'm, it's surprising to know how many people really um, have lived in, in a kind of way alone, um, emotionally alone. And um, the idea that we in the long run um, are maybe going to be the person uh, through whom they can reactivate a sense, am I precious to somebody? Am I important to someone? Um, do I have someone who's really on my side? Now, it goes against our early teachings because, you know, at the beginning, uh, if we set ourselves up against um, infantile needs, we were really adversaries uh, to a great extent with our patients. And I think more and more I can see that um, at some level our patients have to feel cherished by us in some way. Um, you and I once talked about this movie, um, corny movie, Romancing the Stone, and uh, Kathleen Turner, you remember, is uh, uh, on this hunt with Michael Douglas and they're looking for this stone in uh, South America. And uh, they come across it, and you think Michael Douglas has got the world by the tail, knowing him. And they're in this cave. They find it, and um, he shows it, and she said, "Oh, that's great! This is the most special day I've." And he says, "I've never been part of anybody's special day." And it's somehow that caught me. Here this guy in real life seems to have it all, and what if he's really representing? I've never been part of someone's special day. And I think we've got a lot of patients who've never been part of anybody's special day. So, Thank you for being part of my special day okay. today <laughs> and, take, and being part of this interview. I appreciate it.